Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 80. I'm Heidi Kuda. Jim Hi-Fi and I are very excited to be introducing our audience to our friend, Livia Ponzia. She is a researcher and producer of documentary films. Her area of expertise is in media, propaganda, and disinformation with a super hyper focus on Russian disinformation. She also appears on the WTF, What the Fuck podcast, with our good friend Monique Kamara. She also infiltrated QAnon in Europe in the early days, and she's going to bring us information about the many stages of QAnon. Livia Ponzio, we are so happy to have you with us today. I often say RadPod's superhero power is the fact that we are networked globally with experts such as yourself who really understand the stakes of what's happening. And before we jump into your work, understanding the origin story of QAnon and how it's been weaponized with hundreds year old tropes, I'd like to ask you about a breaking news story out of Italy uh, that a pro-Putin conference is being held. There was a lot of uproar about uh, Best Western hosting some of these Putinists and the fact that uh, Alexander Dugan is going to be zoomed in, has people globally up in arms. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. And let me tell you, I follow you for the longest time. You're doing an excellent job. I'm just like um, so happy that you asked me over on a rap pod. So Alexander Dugin, Alexander Dugin, um, who has a special, let's start saying that Alexander Dugin is not new in Italy. He has a special relationship with, with Italy. Um, he has been like a lot on Italian national TV, talk shows, the talk shows of of the kind that you also see on some of your American own news channels, like Fox News, for instance. But um, at this very moment, there is a renewed effort of the Russian propaganda machine. And by renewed effort, I mean renewed um, uh, injections of resources, uh, particularly on the Italian territory. The Italian territory is a territory that is like very permeated uh, by Russian propaganda. So there is a tour of Alexander Dugin uh, in Italy in January, in the next, uh, let's say, a few days, by the end of January. He will be on, for instance, the 20th of January in Modena. Then he will be uh, hosted by the best Western hotel, as you said, in Lucca. Um, and there are like a, a few, let's say, other events always held by this Italian, um, let's say, Russian network, right? So why is it important to stop Alexander Dugan in Italy? Because at, at this point of the war, the narrative in Europe, and especially in Italy, is that there is Ukraine fatigue. And this renewed effort of the Russians to send let their, um, their best propagandist to keep on you know, narrating that Ukraine is lost, that Russia has won, that there is a new world order that is going to come, um, and, you know, in, instilling this philosophy of Alexander Dugin that it's a very much... Um, also has very much to do with the, the with the uh, um, you know this this like rewriting also of religion that we know through QAnon. It's quite important. There are a few groups in Italy that they have like um, that they have started protesting. Um, among them, there is a, a uh, event, a parallel event on the twentieth of January in Modena. Um, to say to the basically to the local administrations that um, you know that we don't want Russian propagandists on our territory. What is worrying is that this Dugin tour has found the, the support of the local administrations in Italy, of the municipality of Modena, the municipality of Lucca, and the latest news is that the the mayor of Modena, at least. Um, is cancelling the support to the Dugin event in Modena. Nothing has been heard yet about Luca. Okay. But 
to understand this, the year ahead, we have to look at this kind of, um, let's say, at this kind of action in the field of info work. Yes. They are starting early, they are very well organized, and they have a very efficient um, network throughout all the Western uh, country and NATO allies. And we yes. are here to make life difficult for them. <laughs> That's right. And thank you so much for using the word network. That is exactly what we are talking about. It is transnational. Jim has done a ton of reporting on Dugan, but in case people don't know who he is, he's a fascist, genocidal uh, you know, quote unquote philosopher that is often referred to as Putin's brain. So these are very, very dangerous people. And many of the fifth columnists in America have adopted uh, his his writing. So let's jump into uh, kind of the, you know, uh, most important. I wanted, to, I wanted yes. to just follow up on that if I could for a second. Please. Um, uh, it, in, that, in that conference, briefly before, um, there's a the there's a fellow named uh, Vigano, I believe, who is yep. uh, going to be joining. And in general, um, you know, there's a there is an underlying religious sort of subversion that's going on here. Um, and, I, and and I think you know, people recall in 2019 there was a plan for Bannon to set up a a fascist camp and Vigano was involved and, and Cardinal Burke and a bunch of these kind of Christo fascist Americans yeah. and, and their allies. I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about kind of how, how the, the, the church and, and, you know, uh, is pushing back on this if, if they are, um, because it seems like that's really the front line of this. Yes. Right? Sure. So um, the the let's say the bigger story around Dugin being so comfortable in Italy, as I told you, this is yet the 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 umpteen time that he finds welcoming you know support in Italy through the institutions, is that there is a let's say there is a I don't know how to call it I want to call it an alliance but I'm I'm not sure is the right term but there there is this crossing you know this crossing of in Italy because we have the Vatican within our territory there is a crossing within uh, religion um, politics far right they are very involved in this kind of uh, operation far right politicians far right groups uh, the far right, let's say, wing of the Vatican, that before the war actually, in Ro the, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, the far right group of uh, Cardinale Burke, uh, Burke and, Card and Monsignor Viganò, um, they were pretty much waging war towards this pope. But now that war seems to be tamed a little bit after the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So what is going on right now and right now in the Vatican, it's not so apparent from the outside, let's say. But indeed, there is also an influx of, um, let's say, of an exchange of knowledge, um, a work through the Vatican of the Russian network. Um, and there is also an injection of money through the Molofiev, the Malofiev, Malofiev yes. active through also the, the extreme right in Vatican, in, in the Vatican in, in Italy, um, through the the um, uh, the, the anti-abortion movement. They are trying also here to introduce an heartbeat law, right? So Cardinale Vigano, sorry, not Cardinale, Monsignor Vigano is a, is a bishop. Monsignor Vigano has been pretty much put on the, on the not outed, but pretty much put, it, put on the side of the, the uh, uh, Catholic church, Roman church community, because during the pandemic, he was like, you know. He's, because, you, he's just you and I now. I yes. mean, he really, yeah. like. It's almost indistinguishable. It's not almost. It is QAnon. I mean, he's talking yeah. about wow. pizza group by name. He's like talking about the darkest sort of, you know, most despicable um, conspiracy theories. Yeah. Also, one bit of good news is that the Pope 
uh, just took away uh, uh, Burke's subsidized yeah. apartment. And yeah. uh, so now his rent went up five times. Uh, yeah. So uh, good, good job, Pope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he also he also went after Opus Dei, right? Mm -hmm. They had a little yeah. bit of a slap on the wrist. And he also went after the uh, Sovereign the Knights of Malta. The, the Order of you know? Malta is uh, yeah. big. Yeah. Is more of a problem he, he knows. Realize. He yeah. knows, but I don't think he's being harsh enough. I think he needs to no. be a little harsher. Well, I think he is to he is to be uh, he might be harsher, but he also has to be careful. Those people are not, you know, are not joking. No, uh, yeah. they are dead dangerous for an yeah. old yeah. aging pope, and that's uh, uh, you know, I'm throwing that in the mix. But the, the thing uh, I am appreciative of his blessing of same sex marriage. Uh, I'm I'm seeing things that uh, where he's making bold statements to basically let people know that he's not part of this uh, encroaching fascist network, or certainly he's pushing back against it. So. Yeah. Um, but, 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 I, but at the same time, it's kind of like controversial because some people say he's not being um, hard enough on yeah. condemning Russia. So, I mean, the Vatican the is always bag. like... Oh, yeah, but yeah. the thing, what, what is interesting, and I'm re really glad that you, uh, I find that you brought up, uh, or was uh, Jim that brought up this topic, is that um, also, the pa this passage of what's going on now on the far right of the church, the Dugins, the the Viganos, the Perke, it's very remindful of how the um, Third Reich interacted with the Catholic the Roman Catholic Church back in the days. They yes. are like, yeah, there are like so many similarities because also back in the days, and this also brings us back to QAnon, is is the Back in the days, what happened is that the Roman Catholic Church initially embraced <clears throat> Nazi fascism because yep. um, Hitler po like, put himself at the center of the church effort to reunify the, the Catholics and the Protestants, right? So Hitler was very Our much... Positive Christianity, right? The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Positive Christianity came later. Positive Christianity, let's say, is more the QAnon of that time, right? But right, at right. the very beginning, at the very beginning, uh, Hitler knew really well the work of Martin Luther. Uh, it, it is said, uh, some you know, some people that some historians say that he took his anti-Semitism from Luther directly, right? So he became immediately very close to the Protestants. And when the, the Third Reich opened up also to the Roman Catholic Church, similarly of what is happening now with this the network, far right um, global network, uh, including Russia, with Russia at the helm, um, they they opened up to the Roman Catholic Church saying, hey guys, we are the people that are gonna mediate between you and and uh, and um, and the Protestants, yeah. right? So there was a lot of support, just like now, there was a lot of support coming from the Roman Catholic Church to the uh, Third Reich, to the rise of the Third Reich, to the Third Reich party. Of course, that, that then let's say took a different form the plan was was not helping you know roman catholic church to uh, reunite let's say with the with the protestants the the the, the real plan of the third reich of hitler of the the heads of the third reich was to reform christianity let's say put christianity at the service of their political schemes of yes their, you know political this and and there you have this idea that was introduced very early of pos positive christianity yeah. by positive yeah. christianity they meant um they meant a let's say a a um you know, it, it, there was this guy, Alfred Rosenberg, who was the, the terrorized positive Christianity. And positive Christianity, in short, is the idea that Jesus was an Aryan 
um, that uh, Jesus was an Aryan, there was a white guy, basically, um, and that, um, and that, uh, and they started actually to have their own rituals, very much like our friends in QAnons, right? Yes. Uh, like General Flynn in this great awakening too, when he does these prayers. If right. you look at old footage, from the the Third Reich religion, because there is some footage that is left, Great. you see that there are many similitudinies. This raising the their, their hands to the sky while they are praying, uh, the processions, you know, the the event, the big events in in um, in uh, in uh, public places, like very much like we see in Q on um, in Q on now uh, in Q on now, and. Um, when the the um, when uh, Hitler fell, uh, there was it was found actually the text of a plan to prosecute Christian churches actually because wow. the next phase for them was to substitute the traditional Roman Catholic Christian Catholic religion with the new Third Reich religion. They wanted to appropriate the Catholic rituals and um, and they wanted to transform the Christian churches in, in, a, in a new religion that just echoed the, 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 the old Christian beliefs. And now, Jim, you can tell me if that doesn't remind you very much of what you're seeing in your yes. recent studies of what General Flynn is doing, right? Yes, yes, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. It also, um, it also is a, it's, it, it reminds me also that the Catholic Church did a lot of helping of the Nazis escape um, from, from Germany, um, yeah. you know, which is just a, an indication of how sort of corrupt and and dark um you know that whole situation was um also just because they're an interest of mine the order of malta was uh very yeah. involved in communications with hitler um you know uh, all the way through the war yeah. um the, the church backed away a little bit um during the war but um you know they just like now there's this whole right wing um, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like the the cult wing of the of the church, right? Um, that's been yeah. there for a long time. Um, that does a lot of these sort of dark operations and communications with, um, you know, bad guys around the world. So, uh, you know, my 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 hope is that that this pope is a is a more moral pope than Pius the Twelfth, I believe it was in in World War Two. Um, uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see, um, you know, what, because this is going to get far worse before it gets better. Yes. Yeah. And, right. and, and the Catholic church has 2 billion people, um, that it can influence. Right. And yeah. so it, it is, it is not a small thing when we're talking no. about, you know, the, the Catholic church and what the Pope's actions are. I mean, that, that. He may be, in some ways, the most powerful man in the world in the sense that he can reach, you know, a quarter of the planet. Yeah. Wow. He can, he work, it's traditionally in Italy, let's say that the Vatican can decide Italian elections, pretty yeah. much like the last wow. one. And politicians are very aware of that. Um, the And... Italian politicians are very aware of that, and and Russian, <laughs> the Kremlin mm -hmm. is very. And we may as well add U.S. politicians. Do you remember that mystery in 2016 on why Trump could possibly attract so many religious people, evangelicals, yeah. with his track record? I just I feel like democracies die in euphemisms when you talk about positive Christianity, but really what it is is a weaponization of people in order to. Uh, push fascism. So, um, Livia, I'm so glad you're here. And that was already such an incredible start to our conversation. Um, we often are together on Kremlin File Lounge. I've been on your podcast with Monique Kamara, WTF, What the Fuck, which is so much fun. <laughs> um, and, you know, this kind of this idea of having you kick off the new year for us, with your knowledge on the origin story and the much overlooked origin story of QAnon really came out of 
me saying that often women are targeted online, and we know that mimetic warfare is warfare, um, where women are tarnished as witches, and almost this kind of fairy tale esque, you know, evil thing. And you said, Oh, well, that's pure QAnon. And here's why. Can you tell people from your perspective in Italy and understanding media and fascism? Uh, more about that and how let's just kind of like go in and jump in and start there. Sure. Yeah, we have, we were having this great conversation. I remember we talked about uh, how women become immediately a target and also together with women. They're, they're, they are these archetypes, let's say, of fascist, of fascist propaganda that they are really like um, repeating and rhyming through history. And now it's a time in history that they are you know, pretty much a rhyming uh, to to a to a drum beat, I would say. Play, plagiarizing uh, is what I usually say at this point. It's not even yeah. right. Yeah, it's not. Well, what I wanted to say, let me say, if I I think you know, looking at this this researching this this kind of topics already for quite a a few years now, what I I I notice is that. It's to it's rhyming too well to believe that the people running those operations, like QAnon, but there are many others, uh, and in the far right, they are not aware of the uh, you know of how the propaganda during the fascist and Nazi year was structured, because they are like uh, Heidi was saying, they are they have certain uh, let's say archetypes uh, stories that archetypes target that they start you know working on one is the women so the women as witches so the the women are either the the um, ancillary you know um beings in 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 the greater project of this uh, male dominated authoritarian world or if they don't want to take that position, they immediately become witches. They are attacked as witches. They are um, they are they are very much you know pushed on the side of society. So the moment that that you see in a in a free society women being pushed on the side, it's a pretty good you know indication to me that authoritarianism, authoritarian forces are at work. And it's not just an unconscious development in our society. That's what I believe. I think that at this time in history, there is a deliberate, there is a deliberate choice of certain groups uh, in, in the Western world, especially in the Western world, to ally with, um, with uh, uh, authoritarian regimes like Putin's Russia um, and all, you know, the satellite uh, authoritarian regimes that go around Putin, Putin, Russia. Another topic that is very much that goes back. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the attacks on women that don't align, that they are not. You know, I just mentioned uh, that Hillary Clinton was literally called a witch yeah, uh, in exactly. 2016. She was a satanic pedophile, and if, yeah. if you go, if you look at the art, uh, you know the the, the Pizzagate art. It's literally yeah. her, like a, as a witch looking over. I just, I, I, you know, what you were saying struck me, you know, really hard. Just thinking back, um, and you know, still looking at this propaganda that that comes out about her. I think it was yeah. a perfect target in that way, and so mirroring it uh, made a lot of sense. If you're you know, yeah, to anyway, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I no, 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 that's really true. Not. And, and why it was really? used against the, it's used against me. I'm always called a yeah. witch and I'm going to be eating some little children. I'm like, well, that's really weird. Well, it is not weird at all. When you no. look at the narrative warfare, uh, that tries to marginalize sideline silence, um, those who are actually, threatening their lies and exposing yeah. their lies. So it becomes much more clear. And I really want to thank you for explaining that. As the gentlemen know, I've been doing a 
a deep dive into the 2016 crime scene of Twitter and and all, you know, navigating my way through the, you know, uh, suspended accounts and yeah. um, the, um, you know, the uh, deleted tweets. And yet there's enough forensics there to see what was going on. And it's like they threw everything yeah, at which- the American psyche at the you know psyche of the people in the UK around Brexit and everything was thrown at them but i think that it's been a huge mistake to overlook uh this type of fairy tale esque horror yeah. story esque narrative warfare that jim and hi-fi have been exposing for years that nobody really wants to look at and why do you think there's such a resistance and we do know there's a lot of money being paid to obfuscate these types of um, origin stories of these conspiracies. And we know that conspiracies are incredibly necessary to push fascism. It's got people have to stop thinking uh, cognitively for this to work. But why do you think there's been such a huge, A, misunderstanding, and B, resistance to exposing how terribly traumatizing and radicalizing these types of narratives are? Okay, from my point of observation, so as you know, we haven't said it here in the podcast yet, but as you know, I ended up being for a project, researching a project, being infiltrated in one of the European biggest QAnon groups, right? So that was like an interesting um, training, (laughs) schooling and researching, I have to say. Um, And um, I see that what I see from my point of observation is that those kind of uh, psyops, those operations, they are organizing militarily, right? It's not a case that your General Flynn comes from the military. And this is pretty much something that Putin knows is is very much used to because since the KGB years, Russia has always considered, maybe even earlier, always consider the uh, the information landscape as a warfare landscape, and this is the way they've been approaching it without any any solution of continuity, right? So, how do they approach this kind of warfare that we are? completely oblivious of, not anymore after the pandemic, but we are still pretty much behind in, in you know, uh, in having the, 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 the full consciousness of, of this being a warfare, right? So how do they approach it? They approach it militarily, which means that they work in stages. It's organized in stages, right? So for the next stage of the operation to be successful, you have to erase the trace of what went wrong in the the stage that preceded it, right? You or you 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 know you you uh, bring to an end um, a, a military operation in info warfare, and then that chapter is closed, and you have to go on and you know implement on what you have achieved. In the in the previous stage, so also QAnon has gone through stages, and this is what I see pretty much also like right now with the Dugin, you know, with all these events organized in Italy. Uh, they are, and ent- we are entering one of the first stages of the 2024 warfare for. European and USA elections. Um, I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, yes, it, it not only begins to answer the question, it brings up so many more things because right now, we talked about this on the show earlier, I'm watching everybody from Trump to Tucker Carlson to Dinesh D'Souza to um, Glenn Greenwald uh, to Charlie Kirk to uh, J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance. They're all covering for a MAGA 3X character who's going to prison for uh, interfering with the election. But 
um, the cut. It's not that the cover up's worse than the crime. It's just the, for me, the cover up shows the crime is far bigger. And I yeah. believe the 2016 election, as do the gentlemen here, that that was a military operation with Putinists in America to to put a, a another Yanukovych type character in uh, the highest office in our country. And I think it was a successful operation. So there is so much exposure. And the fact is, those people that were yesterday was January 6th, those people who were there, Ashley Babbitt's a great example. These people were traumatized and radicalized through what Jim has been exposing, uh, this military operation, this PSYOP uh, known as QAnon as one example of how they got people there. And the fact is, we can't move on from that. We can't just be like, oh, because it's still happening. And as Jim keeps pointing out, they are ramping up these narratives. They may cloak it with a different title, or maybe sometimes they just do a straight reboot. But this all originates with stolen GRU uh, documents. And then uh, and then it you know is sort of expanded from there. But to not see this as soldiers instructed by generals to plant this material and to hack people's minds is to uh, be completely, you know, derelict. Yes. And I believe our government may not want to look at this because to look at any of it is to say what a massive yes. failure has occurred here and is occurring. Uh, I wanted to tell, like, what ID was saying brought to mind something that really struck me uh, right before in the QAnon group I was infiltrating. Like, right before the 2020 election, some weeks, not more than two or three months before, the European groups, they were actually uh, openly while organizing, you know, the great awakening, the great, you know, <laughs> what happened on January 6th at the Capitol Hill in plain sight on their social media, on Facebook, it was all, you, you know, it was all there. And so much so that I always wonder how the FBI couldn't see it. I could see it and I'm a regular person from Europe. But anyway. In, I, I was screaming about it in detail, how it was going to unfold yeah. a week before tagging everybody that yeah. I could possibly tag. And I sent tips. Um, yeah. they, they, it, there's, a, there's a whole thing about, you know, uh, the stand down around January 6th. Yeah. But listen, the European group, and that's also important because not many have, con there's a lot of talking about the American QAnon, rightly so, but there is a European QAnon that it was particularly, let's say, um, active and crucial also in the, in the so-called pastel QAnon phase, right? And in this group, as I was telling you, they, they were the leaders of this group, one of which I knew personally from before. That's how I infiltrated so well from a Dutch, um, you know, from, from when I was in Holland. And uh, they were openly saying, Mike Flynn is our general. The, the, um, the order comes from, my, from Mike Flynn. And what he says we do, we follow Mike Flynn, he is our general. And what happened it was I was in the in the core group that directly communicated with Mike Flynn, but I believe that they from things I was told in the group and from you know various clues, I believe that they there was the, the leaders, the close leaders group in this QAnon big cell, European cell, they had meetings, online meetings, directly with Flynn because a couple of times some of these people say, we have told this Flynn, Flynn wants us to say and do this. So, that is fascinating. I, I, I've, I, I've caught Flynn, I've got yeah, evidence of Flynn being in conversations with QAnon promoters, um, yeah. both back in 2020 and 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 now. So it's it's fascinating to to hear you say that. Yeah. Um, so one one, one thing I wanted That's to mention is that during his reawaken tour, at the very beginning, um, his tour promoter says, "quote 
Jesus, what we believe is Jesus is king, Donald Trump is our president, and Mike Flynn is America's general. Yeah. That I mean that those are the first words of every one of his tour events, um, which I think is a remarkable thing to say about yourself, right? (laughs) And (laughs) that's everything you're talking about. Apologies for it. Yeah. So no, no, but it's great. I mean, there is, there is, let's say, there is a, let's say, it, it, it's, it's a military structure. Uh, I could feel in the group I was infiltrated in that there were orders coming from above, and uh, according to what orders were given uh, at certain stages of the, you know, leading up to the 2020 election, the 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 focus was shifted on you know, certain topics or other topics, right? Um, So, and at one point, that's also interesting because I think that was done purposely. Uh, At one point, they, the group I was in, they left a mass Facebook. They all went to Rumble. And it seems to me that there was a, uh, there was a, you know, coordinated uh, effort to move them all out of Facebook and have them on a more friendly platform. And this, to me, has been also useful to in understanding very early on what was going on with Musk and Twitter. They needed a bigger, more comprehensive platform uh, to work on from uh, for the 2024 election cycle in Europe. My feeling is also that America for them in their, you know, in their, I don't know how to call them, like in in their idea of how to subvert the the global order, America is the first step. They have a plan also in Europe. That's why you see the the all these events, Dugin events in Italy, and all this effort. Because, but by effort, I mean you know, uh, human resources, uh, money, B- because those operations cost money. They are not just something that is online. I know that people tend to think anything that is going on online, it doesn't it doesn't have a, a, a you know it doesn't cost anything to produce. But think. Only how many videos, how many fake documentaries have been produced both in 2020 and today? May, I mean, I've been, Heidi knows it too, like I've been, you know, working on film financing, making these films cost money. So there is a parallel effort of, uh, of the same networks, overlapping networks, far right, uh, Catholic far right, uh, Russians, and so on and so on. That they overlap, and they 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 bring this effort both parallelly in Europe and in the USA. Yes. And as long as we are not looking from you know from this like wider angle, the situation yeah. we will always run in circle in our own country's, you know, predicaments. Thank you for that. And Hi-Fi, I know you have something I want to say. One quick statement and Hi-Fi, you jump in. For me, from the very beginning, Jim said, what is always not there in these QAnon uh, groups, that what's, what's always not there is any criticism of Putin. Yeah. And he said that was like one of the most astonishing things. Well, what's happened all these years later? This, this same, these same groups that have been radicalized with all of these lies are anti uh, helping Ukraine. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think that those two things are not related. And I just wanted to state that uh, because that to me is like when you talk about military strategy, my understanding of how uh, the Russian military and their intelligence works, they have their objective and they start working four steps back. And unfortunately, yeah. in America, as in Europe, there are too many fucking allies uh, willing and ready to facilitate that work for them. Hi, fi So, one thing I know for sure that happened is that uh, Italy 
find Facebook over Cambridge Analytica yeah. in 2019, right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm a big picture solution kind of guy. And I'm trying to figure out this strategy. And here's what I have. And you tell me if this looks like what you've seen in Europe. One, we have the data collection, right? Two, we have the data analysis yeah. leading to social media targeting of people, right? We know they created these oceans profiles, these psychographic yeah. profiles with Cambridge Analytica. Three, they have an organization of teams through reputation management firms or uh, private intelligence firms to run these social media operations, all right? Then we have the inflation of influencers through artificial followers, bots, things like that. Yeah. And because of that fake interaction, they manipulate social media algorithms to put them into people's feeds, specifically people that are being targeted by these oceans profiles. All right. Yeah. Then they generate their information slash narrative warfare. This leads to the recruitment of what are colloquially known as useful idiots, right? Yeah. Then they execute their operations using the idiots and the teams. And this leads to the radicalization of their followers. Does Absolutely. this sound like what you've seen? Yeah, it sounds very familiar. And um, it sounds very familiar, especially if we do a, 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 a concerning Italy. I mean, we do a step back. Because before Ca Cambridge Analytica, in Italy, we had the rise of Casaleggio. Robert, Gian Roberto Casaleggio and then his son Davide Casaleggio, who are the people that pretty much funded um, the Five Star Movement. I don't know if you heard about it, which is this movement that has been as becoming a political entity that um, is now represented by Conte, who has been even prime minister. And if I may say, he's the prime minister who had Russian military during the pandemic, roaming around freely <laughs> on the Italian territory. And nobody knows yet what they really did and if they really left at some point. But anyway, so this is exactly what was done in a much less sophisticated way pre-Cambridge Analytica by Casaleggio e Associati. They organized their, you know, party, the true, what they call, they are called meetups. I don't know if you have them in America. So they are like little groups that you form on, on social media, on, pla on social platforms, sometimes proprietary, sometimes only on Facebook. So people, you know, they get together people around these very populistic topics, this very anti-establishment. This is another trait, the anti-establishment, um, the push towards the anti-media, anti-establishment uh, kind of uh, ideas. Um, obviously, if you wanted to be part of the party of those meetups group, you would have to share your data. And nobody still today, so many years down the road, knows what of that data was, what that data, private data went, uh, because the Casaleggio Associati company uh, is a Swiss company, like he has his, his headquarters in Switzerland. So it's impossible to look into it and to see what they do of this, of this data. I go even further. At one point, they were really pushing to, there was like a, 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 a nationwide, let's say, campaign to get rid of in-person voting. They wanted to make a transition to what they called digital di democracy. Right. And they have applied it within their own party. They have their own platform. Um, the voting is, is very obscure, is not very transparent to regulate their own party, but they wanted to implement it nationally. Right. And this is this has not disappeared on the Italian territory. They are still, and especially in this moment, collecting data um, through all sorts of means, I would say. Um, and the, 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 
what is happening now is that they are, the data collection became more seamless. People do not realize they are being profiled. What they see, though, is the fake influencers the, or the real influencers, right? So there is a huge effort also and resources put into working with TikTok influencers, uh, Instagram influencer, it's it's becoming bigger and bigger. And the other thing I wanted to talk about when I talk about this topic that comes to mind is the fact that they are specifically targeting uh, younger demography, a younger demographic group uh, in society. In fact, in the Dugin tour, is going to visit a school. Is wow. going to go to a high school to talk to uh, to kids. You, you know what, uh, Mike? That Flynn, ain't good. You know what, Mike Flynn's youth Hitler Youth Project is called. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. He's so it's he's aiming at Gen Z and he's calling it Operation Z. Z. Yeah. Which is fucking incredible Absolutely. because that's what what Putin puts on all of his tanks. Yeah. While he's blowing up Ukrainian children. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible uh, how blatant and open it is. And by the way, his tour is named after Dugan's book. Yeah. Yeah. The Reawaken, the the, the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset is the name of the tour. And Dugan's book is the Great Reset versus the Great Awakening. Exactly. And and we we rely on Jim to tell us this. That is what is so amazing because uh, corporate media is studiously ignoring these these terrible red lights that are just blinking everywhere. In the few minutes we have left, and we're going to have to beg you for a part two because we have so much more to talk about. Um, I have two quick things for you sort of in our lightning round here. One of them is what is the, and one thing I want to say is when you're describing all of this mind hacking that goes on related to this global conspiracy effort, QAnon being among them, what we have here in America then is the coordinated uh, Putinist uh, extremist GOP members who then collectively promote those lies, collectively cover yeah. up, collectively say, oh, there were hostages at January 6th. So when you talk about the mass network and mass coordination, we are we are seeing it uh, cranked up to 11 in America at the moment. And in 2024, it is just so dangerous. Um, yeah. two, two things for you. One, what is the most um, horrifying and also important thing that you saw infiltrating QAnon um, in uh, Europe? So the worst things, they were not all the way. I I was there for about two and a half, three years. And in that period, I saw it going from um, pretty much a multi-user danger, like the old multi-user danger kind of games, right? Where they were searching for clues. Uh, They were talking about even laughing about their their, you know, uh, conspirationist clues that they saw in movies, in pop culture. And, but then I, in, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, there was a really fast turn to radicalization. And in that group, which was pretty big, eh? I'm talking about hundreds of people. And in that group, the radicalization was so fast. It came. It came with the release of uh, uh, this movie I, I, that was like I think released also initially by this Dutch woman. She's a UFO truther. She's called um, uh, uh, Osebar, Janet Osebar. She made this uh, this film full of the cabal that was like filled with traumatizing uh, material. That was the yeah. Most it's got like ninety five parts too. It's Huge yeah. that whole thing. Yeah. Huge, and even to me, it was very traumatizing. And I and and with the trauma of the images that she put in those twenty minutes videos, time nine, uh, it came also the trauma to realize actually that nobody is immune. In the European group, you didn't only have like you know, the people with the tinfoil hat, like most people like to think about. And it's not just, you know, your crazy neighbor that never goes out of his house 
uh, or doesn't have like friends loving him that that falls for this. I saw like smart people falling for that, you know, successful designers, you know, with higher top higher education um, in top. Um, European school and I wouldn't say that this radicalization in the group I was in came overnight but it was it was that fast it was fast enough to leave me stunned it went from uh, you know look at the matrix minute you know 1.5 that's a clue uh, that Q is sending us to spreading the hashtag uh, save the children and great awakening, right? And um, with, save, with the spreading of the hashtag of save the children and great awakening came also the more violent instinct in, in some of the people in the group. They really wished for their opponent to die. They really believed that they would be thrown in jail and tortured, that they deserved to be, they, they genuinely hated Hillary Clinton, right? Or people like that. And that's scary, that level of manipulation when you don't realize what is, what is ethical and legal and what is not, what is good for you and what is not, right? And they were talking about the plans of, you know, uh, attacking the capital so much in plain sight, because I think that they genuinely believed that it was their right to do that, that that it wasn't that that kind of violence, it's allowed for them because yeah. they believed that they were saving the world from the cabal. That's absolutely scary. There's also one last thing that I want to say. Going into the 2024 election cycle, it's much harder, at least for me, but I think for many more researchers, to really look into, to have the uh, uh, bird's eye view of what Q, how QAnon is, you know, handling the, the, the 2024 elections, uh, because it's much more atomized now. And there are much more subgroups and the demographics are changing. So the next very scary thing is that in this atomized extreme conspiracy theory landscape used as a military weapon, as we said before, they are targeting very young people. They are targeting the very young people that they are, for instance, politically involved in the Gaza, Israel crisis they are uh, uh, targeting the very extremely young people active in the gaming community and those people are very young eh? they are like 12 years old 13 years old right that is something which should uh, that is a, a field that we should not leave uh, uh, empty. We should not leave unprecedented, right? Yeah, undefended. I mean, we're um, leaving it undefended right now. And that are was... any lawmakers aware of this? Are yeah. any lawmakers in Italy like? Do they know Roblox is a hotbed of neo Nazis? Do they know that? Well, I have to tell you, we with a few colleagues, we are doing uh, like together also with Monique uh, and our podcast that we had. We are doing. Uh, a very, a very hard job. Sometimes frustrating, sometimes depressing. Into pushing forward this, uh, this, um, uh, this discourse also into political circle. And I have to say, with the Dugin problem in Italy, there are now certain parties that they are like national level parties that they have come out openly against the Dugin uh, book tour. It's not a book tour, the Dugin tour. Yeah. Uh, like Azione, which is a, a center left party led by a former minister. Um, there are, the, the uh, you know, there are some political groups that they now understand that it's a, a very serious question. Yeah. It's a it's a, it's very serious to take seriously this kind of problems. Okay, so you know we're talking about Italian parties, Italian political parties going against, uh, you know Dugan, but then you have Italian politicians like here we see Matteo Salvini wearing a Putin shirt, 
at, at an EU function. Like, I, I, do people not realize what's going on? I, I'm confused. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Matteo Salvini is a, uh, is a whole new story. The picture you're talking about, he was not the only one wearing the Putin shirt um, uh, at the European Parliament. Actually, next to him, there was this guy called uh, Fontana his family name, and who is now the number three in the line of su succession of the Italian government, wow. is our the equivalent of your house speaker, and who's also the guy who wow. wrote a book in Italian on the great replacement theory, talking about very old wow. conspiracy theories. The Salvini's party, but it's not the only party in Italy, I you know, Salvini's party has been carrying water for Putin for ages already. Um, there have been also investigations uh, into their the financial dealings. Um, now it's too long to talk about it, but it's quite important what went on there. Um, the fact is that they were actually, Dugin was brought for the first time to Italy by Salvini's party by wow. La Lega back in the day. So it's a very long time ago. So what what this makes me think of always is that even though he's doing this in plain sight, right? Um, and do and people do understand it. You know, most Italians are are, are not stupid, let me tell you. Yeah. But even though the 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 slow process, the slow democratic process allows for these people to stay in their positions of power for way too long. And it's I think it's a thing that you're experiencing now Absolutely. the hard way also in America because all the organizers of the January 6th uh, insurrection are still free, yeah. if I'm not wrong, right? You're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. Yeah. And uh, similarly, in Italy, we have Salvini who wears a Putin shirt in the European Parliament still being a minister. So I don't say that the democratic process is wrong, but it needs certainly, uh, you know, some reflection, some some thinking. Um, an upgrade. On, as Hi-Fi really would say, an, an upgrade, yeah. So one last thing for me, and then Jim, I want you to bring us home. Um, what What do you expect the extreme conspiracism operations and propaganda impacts will be in light of the 2024 elections, if we do not have some high level arrests and we do not defend um, our people from these types of operations, do you just have like a, a quick thought there? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I was just in the, in the United States. I'm just back from the United States. And what I've seen on both legacy media and social media has me worrying very much. There is... Um, it's not so much what I see now is not so much about the proper pushing back because, you know, people are more aware, both in Europe and the United States, of what this information is, what this information does. And you guys are doing a great job on telling people that for the longest time. But it's more about the framing. In the, you know, in the wake of the 2020 election, towards the 2024 election, this Russian disinformation, this information operation in general, have become more sophisticated, way more sophisticated. And it's very hard. We have seen it in the Israel-Gaza situation. Too long to talk about it now. But um, it's very hard to... Uh, you know, to distinguish for lay people now. And I fear that in that confusion, the bad actor to have uh, could have a win. We have to relentlessly challenge uh, their narratives and, and their structures. But at the same time, we don't have to play their game. I think it's quite important. And not playing the game means also don't get lost in the sense of uh, endless outrage that those kind of like, um, you know, those kind of like uh, stunts, I don't know how to call them, disinformation stunts um, are put in our, you know, social and legacy media. It's happening in America every day. It's happening in Europe as well, less, less frequently. Um, 
we have if we want to win this we don't have to play by the rules and we have to realize that uh, truth is a very rare currency going towards like sharp truths are a very rare currency going on social media and legacy media going towards the 2024 election we have to be smart we have to be sharp and uh, hopefully because we are more than they are they they seem to be a lot because they shout really loud but we are more people we are like a larger crowd of people hopefully we will have it uh we will have we will win this uh incredible battle that i don't is i don't see anything i haven't seen anything similar even even thought it possible when i was studying um the the nazi propaganda to ever come back in uh, uh in reality but um we are at that point we have to meet the moment and i'm sure that we will be able to meet the moment if we keep up the good work and we make the rules of the game and not follow their rules of the game. Ooh. Wow, Livia, that was brilliant, Jim. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, you've you've said so many uh, things that have have just made me feel sane, and I want to uh, I want to thank you uh, just for for your time and all of your your work. Um, for me, I think there's a there is a fundamental sort of hidden thing uh, in America, which is, you know, we're, we, there's an enemy. There is an enemy. There is a, um, and it's, it's complicated, right? There's a, as we've talked about, there's an extreme religious group that's kind of allying with, with another group. But where's the money coming from? As you said, where is the motivation coming from? What is the, what is the objective of all of these movements? Why is it that every time I say anything on on X, I get a bunch of people saying, "Oh, you're you're stupid because you have a Ukraine flag, right?" in your bio. That that is that is their instant like reaction, right? Yeah. How how can we collectively as a as a globe, right? Because it's not just America, as we've been talking about for an hour. As a globe, come to terms with the fact that we have a common en enemy and that we need to unite against him, no matter what our, our personal um, sort of beliefs are. doesn't matter. For, for me, if there's a, a dictator raging across Europe, um, murdering civilians, um, that should be a red alarm and fire for everyone. And then you can what he's doing inside of our countries by all of this infiltration. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm searching for some wisdom on how we can kind of unite around that theme. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does totally make sense. We have to find, you know, democracy, uh, Western democracy, I think it was so good to our society that we have become lazy, probably. And um, because we have lived through, uh, you know, uh, post-World War II and, you know, even through the Cold War years, we have lived through prosperous times, right, mm -hmm. where... The, the democracy is not perfect, let's say that. But where all in all, we have a good life, we can make a good living. So we, I think we have to shake off that laziness and realize that um, our way of life may come to an end. It's really, it's, a, it's a, an existential threat. Yes. And whereas the far right, and uh, the extreme conspirationists and the Russians, they want to push our existential fears day in and day out, yes. nuclear bomb and this and that, you know, and, and, and the obsession with the children, which we didn't talk enough, but we should also talk about the obsession of these groups with children. Um, those are all manufactured, yes. let's say, manufacture existential you know, threats and crises. The real existential threat is that in a very 
hard historical conjunction, we may we may lose our way of living for ourselves, yeah. for the future generations. And, you know, I see it as just like my grandfathers fought to liberate Italy from fascism. Now is our time to find common ground, to get out there, meaning our social media feed uh, or, you know, public events or whatever, or simply going into the voting, the, the, the ballot box, <laughs> putting your vote into the ballot box. We have to believe deeply that even if we feel we are alone, our voice counts our individual voices counts our individual votes counts um and we can make a difference we can keep you know keep this way of life as long as we can and for the next generations if we meet this moment and if we meet this moment together right yeah as jim said like you know grouping around you know common ground so mm -hmm. let's let, I would say let's lose less time into feeling outrage and mm -hmm. spend more time into creating uh, this common ground for us to work on. They are afraid of us. They wouldn't invest this much money if they wouldn't be afraid. Of and course. This much hurts, right? You know what I mean? Yes. But, yes, so, because they're because they're liars. It shows yeah. how powerful narrative warfare is, but it also is helpful to know that when we expose it and take some of the mystery out of it, that we get yeah. back to reality and we get into action and we fight and defend what is rightfully ours, which is our precious democracies globally. Oh, Livia, thank you so incredibly much for being here with us today. You've taken us on a very, um, you know, gnarly journey, but you've also given us uh, action steps on how we can control the outcome of this. And uh, a lot of it is just by people understanding that we do have much more power and the people who are liars do fear those who tell the truth. So thank you so very much. You rule. Thank I, you, I just Heidi. Wanna say, I just want to say, Livia, uh, as a way of goodbye, bella ciao. Bella ciao. <laughs> Bella ciao forever. Ciao. Bella, bella ciao just like 80 years ago.